This is a bizarre one from start to finish. A prominent attorney and his wife are savagely attacked in a grisly home invasion. Torture, assault, shooting, stabbing. Blood was pouring out all over everywhere. When cops pull over the getaway car, what they see is unbelievable. This passenger was literally wearing an adult diaper, and that was it. So who appointed themselves judge, jury, and executioner? And why? This could have been some sort of revenge plot. Leo Fisher and his wife, Susan Duncan, both 61, were living a great life. Susan was recently retired from a career in government. Leo was a respected attorney and managing partner at the law firm of Bean, Kinney, and Corman. Leo is a fine attorney. This is a lawyer who was all business. Their upscale neighborhood of McLean, Virginia was comfortable, quiet, and safe. Until one evening, when their bliss turned to bloodshed. It's 6.15 on a crisp November night. Susan was cooking dinner, and Leo was in the living room reading a book. The doorbell rings. Leo goes to the front door, and in a heartbeat, a man forces his way inside. The intruder tases Leo, shooting him directly in the chest. The intruder quickly binds his hands and legs with zip ties. As Susan runs in, the strange man says he's here with the Virginia Security and Exchange Commission, and he's there to arrest Leo. The man then binds Susan's hands and feet and begins his investigation. This intruder with a taser comes in with a badge, and right. at first it looks like it's legitimate. Sure. But it's not. No. What did the badge read? Pecker Inspector. A bachelorette party novelty badge. Was his face covered? No, his face was not covered. But strangely, he was in a costume of sorts, wearing all black and an Indiana Jones style hat. The intruder starts interrogating Leo, asking strange questions like, had Leo put a hit on a drug cartel member for $370,000? And did he know someone had put a hit out on him for 27,000? The guy was asking all kinds of bizarre questions, and Leo had no clue what this guy was even talking about. Eventually, the man puts Susan in the bedroom, then continues to interrogate Leo while flipping the porch light on and off. At this point, it just seemed like a lone attack. It, it appeared as though he was operating all by himself, but why was he continuously flashing the porch light as to perhaps send a message to someone on the outside? The man forces Leo to his computer, making him access the law firm's private server as he makes calls to someone he refers to as boss. The intruder wanted to take a look at some of the documents, but interestingly enough, did not download anything. He didn't copy anything. Then the assailant seems to make a game-changing mistake. The guy said to Leo, have you let anyone go lately from your law firm? At that point, Leo was able to recognize the fact that maybe this home invasion has something to do with this place of work. A fact Leo would keep close to the vest. Susan tells the intruder she has to go to the bathroom. Unbelievably, he cuts her zip ties. He then continues to interrogate Leo. The intruder was also asking about money and gold bars. If he had any in the home. That's right, and Leo told him he didn't keep that kind of cash on hand in the house. The suspect slit his throat and even tried to suffocate him by throwing a pillow on his face. Susan opens the door to a ghastly scene. She literally saw this intruder on top of Leo, stabbing him, striking him in the head. And then at that point, the individual turned his attention to Susan. He pulls out a gun. The bullet grazed Susan's head. Before Susan can reach the phone, the man stabs her in the neck and all over her upper body. Blood was pouring everywhere. Reportedly, the man walks over to Leo, kicks him in the head and says, quote, you're going to die. But Susan, refusing to give up, hits a panic button. 
the alarm starts blazing throughout the home. And at that point, it is believed that's what frightened the intruder away. The intruder finally flees, and Susan manages to call 911. When police got to the scene, Leo had managed to crawl uh, part way out of the house, and there was just blood all over his clothes, and there was blood all over the home. Then, like a scene in a thriller film, Leo does the unimaginable. Unlucky for the intruder, both victims survive. And incredibly, Leo believes he knows the attacker's identity. Shockingly, through a slit throat, he tells police the name, starting with the letter S. Leo was able to literally spell the name of the person he thought was the intruder. He actually spelled the name Schmuel. Cops soon deduce they are looking for a man named Andrew Schmuel. They put out an APB for this vehicle, and lo and behold, two uh, uh, police officers from Fairfax County spotted this particular vehicle on 495. A high-speed chase ensues. They'll still reach around in the back seat a whole lot. Four miles later, the driver pulls over and exits the car. It's a woman. <laughs> so where's Andrew? With guns still drawn, cops approach the car, and that's when they see it. This passenger, the male, was literally wearing an adult diaper, and that was it. And there was also blood stains on the adult diaper. Hey, what's your name? Hmm. Huh? Andrew? Andrew? What's your last name? What's your birthday? Something's wrong. Something's wrong with you? Yes. They can probably show you now. Yeah, we got the ambulance coming. So they've got Andrew Schmuel in custody, but who's the woman? Hey ma'am, did he take medicine or something? It's Andrew's wife, Alicia. Does he have a medical condition? He has a lot of medical conditions. Call the VA, they've got all his records. Andrew is taken to the hospital, then cops bring him to the station where Alicia is already being interrogated. Investigators eventually search the car and find what appears to be a mountain of evidence. Police found his clothing and his clothing was blood soaked. They also find a taser, an Indiana Jones style hat, a novelty badge, handcuffs, burner phones, ammonia, which the bloody clothes are doused in, and a hit list with other names on it. And they find more. They found what they're calling an abduction kit. Parts of a Cobra 380, believed to be the handgun used they found the knife that was actually used to stab both victims. And in a search of their home, even more incriminating evidence, including a receipt for the taser and adult diapers. So who are these apparently sadistic, cold-blooded perpetrators, Andrew and Alicia Schmuel? They both met in law school. Alicia, she was the senior editor at her law school newspaper. She played the violin, worked with children. From all appearances, she was a very well-liked individual. Andrew was an attorney, and he worked for the government and the military. He hurt his back in 2012, and then as a result of that, he was prescribed a lot of different medication. And because he could not work, Alicia became the breadwinner of the family. Amazingly, these violent individuals who attempted to kill Leo and Susan are fellow attorneys. And where did Alicia work? With Leo himself at the law firm of Bean, Kinney, and Corman. My understanding is, is that Leo, in fact, was a supporter of hers. So what was the motive? Why did Andrew and Alicia Schmuel, two talented attorneys, commit such a heinous crime? Investigators consider many theories, but ultimately believe it all strangely stems from a loan application, where the couple fraudulently used Andrew's name. On the loan application, she listed Andrew as working for the law firm. And when Leo confronted her, she initially denied it, but he instructed her that this could be considered fraud. And her actions would potentially make the law firm look bad. The next day, Leo suspended Alicia. Andrew went to confront Leo. The meeting didn't go well. Andrew became very upset, very loud, very belligerent. Leo eventually fired Alicia, and just 11 days later, the Schmules carried out the horrific home invasion. The violent ordeal so devastating, Leo and his wife have never spoken publicly, turning down numerous requests from Crime Watch Daily. The motive 
in all of this was? The motive in this case eventually uh, was believed to be greed and revenge. Alicia and Andrew were just so upset by the fact that Alicia had lost her job at this law firm that they wanted to get even and they wanted to get paid. Andrew and Alicia Schmuel are each charged with seven felonies, which include abduction, aggravated malicious wounding, burglary, and weapons charges. 18 months later, the case goes on trial. You have attorneys who are the suspects, attorney who is the victim, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys. Too many attorneys for one case, that's for sure. Alicia's and Andrew's cases would be tried separately. Andrew's trial was first. His defense? Well, Andrew blamed the medications he was on, and he blamed his wife, Alicia. Andrew's attorney argued that here you have an individual that was so out of it because of the medication that was provided to him by Alicia, and she used him basically to commit this horrific crime. He had no idea what was going on. His team of attorneys, they came up with the involuntary intoxication defense. The problem I assume they had is, is that they didn't have the right opinions as far as um, Andrew being legally insane. He's wearing a diaper, so there's obviously issues here, um, but he goes into the house. He's violent in the house. They take steps to escape. Including the quote unquote interrogation portion. Right where he's interrogating Leo Fisher and having him log into the private server and going through the emails. So all of those steps, that all appears to be with thought. Um, it's really inconsistent with intoxication where somebody is um, not aware, is out of control. The case later goes to the jury and seven hours later, a verdict. Guilty on all charges. The advantage that the prosecution had was the fact that the victims lived. And by them being able to recognize and to identify their assailants, I think is what really sealed this case for the prosecution. Andrew Schmuel's sentence, two consecutive life terms plus 98 years. He is going to, um, in all likelihood, die in prison. Next up is Alicia. She claimed Andrew was abusive and controlling, and he was the true mastermind behind the attack. Ultimately, Alicia decides to avoid a trial and takes a plea deal to five of the seven charges. She is sentenced to 45 years. The Fishers didn't ask for this. They didn't deserve this. This was a vicious, premeditated um, assault of the worst sort. So two attorneys are now two prisoners for possibly the rest of their lives. And the scars from that horrible night may never go away for their two victims, Leo and Susan. But they are survivors who fought for their lives and won. Was justice served in this case? I think justice was served in this case. And at the end of the day, our victims survived. That's right. Yeah, that's the silver lining in this case. The victims survived.